Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Navigating the Complexities of Self-Care Culture. My name is Jason Partridge. I'm a VP of Client Experience at Lux Research. Uh, I was also one of the co-founders at Lux Motive Base, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Uh, presenting today are my colleagues, Derek Gingrich, Director of Anthropology, and Matthew Watton, Anthropologist at Lux Research. Now, throughout the webinar, uh, I just want to let everyone know that they can type any questions that you have into the box on your screen. And time permitting, we're going to try and get to those questions as best we can. Uh, but don't worry if your question does not get answered. Uh, there's a couple things we can do. You can email us at questions at luxresearchinc.com uh, and we will respond. That's questions at luxresearch.com uh, or somebody will reach out to uh, kind of get back to you if we see that a question got missed and we didn't actually get to address it. Um, I'm really excited about this session uh, and we're going to get the ball rolling. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Derek and Matt, it's uh, over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Jason. Uh, today we're going to be, as Jason introduced, discussing the complexities of self-care culture and really picking apart the wellness frenzy that we're seeing today. Uh, so as I'm sure everyone here is aware, there's a frenzy of new wellness products constantly on the market, as well as wellness conversations among consumers. We have everything from, you know, your traditional oils, spa, acupuncture, but also nutritional products wellness in the self in the personal care space, new wellness oriented face creams and night masks. And then of course, more digital digital evolutions in the wellness spaces as well, such as uh, VR fitness, meal planning apps. And amid, among this real frenzy, what we want to do today is decode what this means among consumers and not really what the wellness trends are in terms of what's being produced but the, what the wellness trends are in terms of what people want and what people are looking for. So we can think of the wellness frenzy kind of in this healthy to possibly damaging behaviors spectrum we have here with things that we generally agree are fairly healthy, like body positivity, looking for supplements to improve your nutrition, using more natural, healthy personal care products. But then on the other end, we can see possibly damaging or negative aspects of the wellness frenzy in this self-care culture. I'm thinking about things like self-diagnosing on TikTok and arriving at very erroneous conclusions because the <laughs> feed convinces you, uh, or melatonin overuse because other things you're doing in your life are making it difficult to sleep. And then you become either uh, addicted or you require melatonin in order to fall asleep as consumers see it. So. We've seen these tensions coming out in the uh, wellness frenzy and products are delivering all sorts of possible solutions and consumers are sort of trying to navigate this space and find what they want. So to decode the culture from a consumer led perspective, we at Lux Motive Base's predictive anthropology team use a process we call predictive anthropology to both uncover the meanings in consumer conversations and then more importantly, predict how those meanings will shape the future of consumer space. So we use big data analytic tactics, as well as some machine learning tactics to look at how consumers discuss topics today and use massive data and pattern recognition to determine where those meanings are likely going to converge in the future. For us today, simply put, that means we're really looking at what self-care will mean to people in the next one, two, five years as we look through this. So to give us a sense of the space and how it's ev evolving from a consumer perspective, we've invited our anthropologist, Dr. Matt Watton here to speak with us. And I'd like to pass it over to you to really give us a sense of how are consumers facing this onslaught of options and these sort of tense negotiations when they're trying to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Derek, and thanks, Jason. Uh, yeah, so we're going to look at the culture of wellness, and one of the takeaways that I, I'm going to lead up with, and hopefully you'll be convinced of by the end, is that wellness is anything but a seamless part of our day, and it's this seamlessness or lack of seamlessness that's driving the aspects of wellness culture that are growing to grow and uh the, the, the explanation for why certain aspects of wellness culture are not growing is that it's about routine and seamlessness or uh, feeling burdened or overtaxed by wellness. That's the tension here. And indeed, it's the seamlessness that we could see 
um, from our sizing tool that wellness in, in this frenzy is kind of going through a reset. Uh, the way we size things, you could see that we both size uh, how how interested the the, the uh, how mature uh, the culture is. So we could see that wellness sits in the mainstream acceptance. That means it is a real topic of interest among consumers, a topic of conversation, a topic of discussion. Uh, but we could also see that we're not able to predict its growth. We use the language we call it volatile, and that this volatility is an indication that consumers views are undergoing a change, that there's no dominant narrative around what wellness means to consumers here, and that really no champion has emerged in the wellness scene as to sort of take over and lead the charge forward for consumers. Uh, and it's this volatility that I think we'd like to explain. And, and, and the way to do that is we could look at cultures within the larger culture of wellness and see which ones are growing and we could see which ones are also volatile and by analyzing those specifics we could get a larger understanding of how consumers are discussing and 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 going about incorporating wellness into their lives that's interesting so this sounds like it's a very important time to really action on what consumers want then if it's already sitting in the mainstream but it's volatile. Uh, I think you used the word champion, and I think it's a great word to use. It means that there really is no champion of this space right now. There's no one delivering a perfect solution to consumers based on their emerging needs. Otherwise, we would probably see growth. If consumers have needs and there's already solutions aligned to those needs, we would see growth. Uh, but as you said, it looks like some volatility is coming up. So why don't you talk to us about the main sources of that volatility right now? Yeah, so we'll zoom in. And so these are the five cultures that we'll, we'll really zoom in on and we'll see which ones are growing and which ones are causing volatility. We'll start with the, vol the volatile ones and then we'll see how the growing ones are the, you know, the antidote or the solution to uh, or giving what consumers don't find in these volatile ones. So a good place to start is proactive health management. And I think it's a good place to start uh, for a couple of reasons. One is the intuitive reason that if you think about wellness, if you think about self-care, these are the type. This is very much the type of thing I think that a lot of consumers and a lot of people in general will think of: taking charge of your health, taking charge of your body uh, uh, in a proactive sense. Uh, but if we look at its uh, its maturity and its projected growth, we see that this is volatile. We see that it is. Uh, bordering on mainstream acceptance it's in it's in the early consensus but quite large which again indicates it's a concern it's something that consumers are very interested in but again its volatility means that there's something going on here that consumers are having having changed views or or not in agreement about the way forward and so what aspect of proactive health management is not satisfying consumers needs if we zoom in on some of the themes, I think there are two broadly that we could really uh, pull out. And one, the first theme on the, in the chart here is uh, about self-advocacy and, and autonomy in the medical community. So I, it, it appears that consumers, when they go to traditional avenues of medical care, just don't feel that they're being heard or being taken care of, specifically with the idea of getting proactive care. They see traditional avenues of wellness, of, of, of health care specifically, as largely reactive when they are looking for more proactive. You go to the doctor when you get sick, whereas consumers want to treat, would prefer to treat root causes rather than wait for symptoms to arrive. And then when they try and do that, they're faced with barriers to access. Try, go try to get a, a blood panel from your doctor just for preemptive reasons. I'm sure that's uh, n not a very easy thing to do. And it's connected in general with lack of like health healthcare access in general. So their desire to be proactive is part of a desire to take charge of their own health. Uh, and it's just not being met by traditional avenues. This is inspiring them to seek alternative approaches to healthcare to be proactive. These alternatives could be anywhere from taking holistic approaches or naturopathy and things like that to things like self-diagnosis, checking internet, checking TikTok, right. other forums and things like that, where they can be more proactive and take charge of it. 
But that in turn shifts the, the teeter-totter almost too far the other way. And while they're able to take charge, it's I think it's really seen as a burden for these consumers. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, they, they get a sense of this autonomy. Now the entire ball is fully in their court. They have mm -hmm. they feel like they're on their own. They are forced to try a bunch of new things, spend time reading and, 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 and investigating and sort of going down these rabbit holes for proactive care. And so there's on the table, there's both traditional and alternatives and, and neither really seems to be satisfying their desires for proactive. Either they can't get the approaches they need, they don't feel heard, or the alternative routes available to them or just a lot of work and, and really putting the onus on them. So then why isn't one of the mainstays uh, for proactive healthcare, I'm thinking diet and specifically moving to more natural, uh, natural sources of food, of energy, et cetera, et cetera. Why is that not working as the solution to this problem? Because I think that would be kind of a classic response we would have seen maybe five years ago. Yeah, that's very much something that we did we have seen and and if we look at something within the natural space we could see that it, it just isn't working in the same way uh for much the same reason so we could think a lot of different uh, uh about maybe about inputs and outputs right like uh the, when you, when i think consumers talk about going natural they're thinking about oh what i'm putting into my body has to be natural and that's the way to mm -hmm. to to improve my overall wellness maybe within this proactive space and we can look at things like sugar that's a that's a very common one people are concerned about cutting out but here in this presentation we zoomed in on the culture of caffeine right i think mm -hmm. that's something that a lot of consumers could think about as oh caffeine is this the right thing for me what what should i reduce that how should i you know i want to boost my energy that feels like a wellness thing Ca they sort of single and zero in on something like caffeine as something that's either natural and and or not natural or just what they're doing right but we could see if we look at the culture of reduced caffeine again we get this volatility it's mm -hmm. again something yeah. consumers talk about it's in the early consensus but it's not we can't predict this growth because we find that consumers are not agreeing on, on it there's some tensions that are arising and i think the caffeine speaks to broader tensions within this natural space in that Again, the effort involved is mm. is overburdening consumers, right? They they you know say you want to identify. Oh, I think caffeine, the the caffeine choice of mine. I t I drink coffee every day. That's not doing it for me. In fact, affecting my wellness negatively. I get jitters. <laughs> I get headaches. I get stomach aches or something like that. Well, the available options to them are largely other sources of caffeine. They're encouraged to try that, but the what, what that does is just say, oh, sub this out, try this other thing. You know, I'm going to try tea for two weeks. Oh, I don't like that. I'm going to try energy drinks for a little while. And all it is doing is not at all feeling, it's not changing their routine. You're just change, they're being invited to change their inputs. And that's just more trial and error. And, and it just, I don't think it's working for, for consumers in the, in much the same way that they're looking to be, to, for they're looking for something else that feels more integrated into their routine than just trying a new product or trying a new natural solution every time yeah. they're not satisfied with the current one. Yeah, what, what strikes me about what you're saying is, is this idea of active management again, where the caffeine is sort of an active management solution where you're feeling tired, you have some caffeine, and then maybe you have trouble sleeping, uh, so you take melatonin, or uh, if you're sticking with natural solutions, maybe valerian root or something. And then the cycle mm. of actively reacting, especially if these are people starting to think a little proactively, it does sound like a lot of active reaction. Uh, so I can see how this desire for volatility is really butting up against that. Uh, or sorry, this desire mm -hmm. for agency is really butting up against that. So. Uh, You've identified these sources of volatility and these problems within the health, health uh, self-care space as consumers are navigating this frenzy. But what is there anything growing? Are there things developing that seem to be the sort of hidden future of this space from a consumer perspective? For sure. And I think, yeah, by looking at what is growing, we could see what is going right there uh, that's not happening in these other cultures. So the first one to look at 
is uh, holistic stress management. Uh, and if we look at this culture, the, to look at the culture of holistic approach, we see not only is it the, one of the largest cultures in terms of its maturity, we could see it is indeed growing. It's going, uh, we're predicting that it's gonna reach a mainstream consensus in the next one to two years. And so and the idea of, of taking a holistic approach, specifically a holistic approach to self-management is really dominating this culture of wellness. It, and it's, per, it's, it's the avenue we're predicting will, that will be going forward, that will be, uh, uh, provides a nice narrative for that consumers can agree on. And really what's at the core here is that consumers really see a connection between the mind and the body. And they think that hmm. understanding and attending to this connection is really a way forward. That really is at the heart of wellness in that it's not just about doing what's right for your body or, or you know, do, doing things that are good for your, your mental health care, that it's actually the connection between the two is a route that's available for them to take the types of approach to wellness that they value, this type of proactive approach mm -hmm. that, and that the, and a proactive one that's integrated into their routine, one that doesn't cordon off, oh, I have to do X and Y for my body and my, my physical health, and then I have to do Y and Z for my mental health and, and just sort of an additive approach. Instead of that, they take a holistic approach that sees their whole system as a, as a connective thing that's sort of at the core of wellness. So uh, as an example, for uh, can you explain to me how something like natural skincare would be holistically integrated with sleep to manage stress? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something we see uh, specifically in the idea of certain products. We could see like uh, infused lotions or moisturizers that are infused with things like lavender or even CBD. Uh, those uh, ingredients uh, are calming. They calm the nervous system. They promote sleep because that's how consumers view them. And the idea is, look, you're, you're already going to be doing a, a moisturizer. You're going to be putting on lotion at night. So instead of you're not re, you're not integrating a new thing. You're not, oh, I need to take melatonin to sleep. I'm already doing the skincare things. It's the idea for I, I, that I think is really attractive to consumers is that just small tweaks to their existing routine, it was actually very, you know, promotes mm -hmm. this. So I'll, I'll switch to a, a nighttime cream with lavender that will, you know, not only moisturize my skin, but that'll help me fall asleep. That'll get me into the bedtime mode. And then by falling asleep better, I will naturally have more energy. Uh, I, you know, maybe don't have to take as much caffeine. They see sleep and, and connected mm. with helping their skincare in the long run because they're not going to be as stressed. And so they see there's a cycle here, but instead of a vicious cycle of mm. trying new products, it's a, it's a cycle that is pr promotes itself. That seems integrated and, and seems like a very logical and natural, re naturally reinforcing itself is maybe a way to put it. I see. And then naturally taking care of your skin, I suppose, reduces other sources of stress. Uh, but also by reducing other sources of stress and helping you sleep, you reduce the chance of breakouts. And these things are sort of feeding each other healthily as opposed to reacting to a breakout, reacting mm -hmm. to poor sleep. That, that's Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's exactly right. It's... That's interesting. So it sounds like it's a lot about working with uh, your routine in this space as mm -hmm. well as working with your body or, and the connection between your routine your body and your mind uh, do we see this mm -hmm. as a sort of unique or do we see this playing out in other uh cultures of self-care that you've analyzed yeah we see this exactly the the this re-emphasis this rethinking of the body in a in a very specific way mm -hmm. uh you mentioned earlier po body positivity as one aspect mm -hmm. of the wellness frenzy and for a time that was, you know, that was prominent. That's in the, that's in the lexicon now. Uh, it's changed around that. I think body positivity has gone from something that's helpful for consumers as a way of thinking about wellness to a source of stress, to a source of anxiety. And we're seeing this shift from the language of body positivity to a, to a rethinking in what is termed body neutrality. And the difference here is that body neutrality isn't unlike body positivity isn't always about loving yourself but it's more about accepting your body uh, it's about mm. listening to your body instead of focusing on its physical appearance it's about understanding your your body and your what your body needs and what that's telling you and that will dictate 
how you go about approaching mm -hmm. wellness. And so body neutrality here is a, is a culture that is predicted to have some really large amount of growth uh, in, in, the, in the short term here. And it's because this new way of thinking really speaks more to consumers' concerns, uh, whereas taking a body neutral approach, not only does it make them feel good, make their body feel good, but again, it also think t it takes into account the sort of mental health aspects of taking care of their body. It's not about, oh, I got to hit all these goals. I'm stressing about how, my, how toned I look or how many reps I could do at the gym. Or, or you know doing all these hard metrics for for physical tracking rather we see a, a more interest in things that like feel good in my body the type of exercise that just makes me feel good give me a sense of euphoria as well as you know a sense that i'm i'm working out so you know doing pickleball or joining a a, a softball team instead of becoming like a gym rat or training for a, a triathlon these feel more accessible to the average consumer, but they also mm. speak more to what like their wellness values are in terms of body neutrality, rather than you know the, this sort of top-down pressure to to improve their body that was part of the body positivity. I think. Interesting. What I noticed about that too is we kind of are getting to the space of reactivity versus agency again, where. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of reacting to the doctor saying no to your proactive blood panel or reacting to your need for energy and then reacting for your the fact that you feel like you should be falling asleep but you don't feel tired, uh, this similarly, body positivity could evolve into something where you're reacting to a certain set of physical expectations, namely loving your body no matter its shape. And if you don't love your mm -hmm. body, you're failing it. There's this kind of hard metric that you can convince yourself is there. Uh, where body neutrality seems to be an answer to that, where you are embracing what your body can do. Maybe, as you said, going to the gym, you're improving your body, but it's about what your body does for you. Uh, and it's about looking at your body sort of as a holistic thing that does, that eats, that instead of looking at your body solely through the lens of appearance, which can cause quite a lot of stress. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, yeah, I can still see exactly where right. some some sources of stress could emerge. Uh, for example, uh, if you're trying to take a body neutral approach, uh, would you not still run up into self care concerns around what you're eating and how you're eating and how that's fueling your body? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very much part of it, and, and and some aspects of body neutrality are associated with things like uh, intuitive eating, for example. Uh, but another avenue I think we wanted to focus on here that maybe is sort of less thought about in as, as an aspect of wellness is meal planning. Uh, and we could see if we, if we look at that in our culture, we see that's something, again, uh, consumers are interested in. But it's, it's something that's slowly emerging and is predicted to have some, uh, a small amount, but definitely growing in the short term. And this is going along with, I think, just as we saw in a lot of these spaces, there's a rethinking about the body, rethinking about the connection between the mind and the body. Here, too, I think there's a rethinking about the place of things like food and nutrition in the, the overall culture of wellness, in the overall approach to wellness. And so uh, what is emerging as really key here in the wellness space around food is something about food anxiety, the way food uh, and, and your concerns, consumers' concerns about what they're eating and how they're eating uh, is a source of, of stress and, and strain and mental anguish, or <laughs> anguish might be too strong, but anxiety for sure. And so it's, while nutrition surely is something they're, they're considering, but they're, they're thinking less about the focus on, again, these inputs hitting my macros, that's language that uh, was quite prominent in the, in the wellness space. Now, if we think about uh, meal planning as a solution to food anxiety, we get things more concerned about balance, right? Balance between indulging my, my desires for food and nutrition. Mm -hmm. And doing something like meal planning addresses that balance as opposed to something like a diet where you're on strict strict days and then cheat days. That really encourages consumers to to, you know, eat in excess, both excess good and excess bad, 
whereas something like a, a taking a, a, a more planning approach gets them some balance. There's other things as well. Again, if we're thinking, we're moving away from thinking about food just as a source of nutrition. Uh, they're also thinking about the whole process of cooking and eating food as a part of their routine, as a valuable part, as a, as a valuable part of me time, right? A time to reflect, a time for, you know, mental health check-ins, whether that's, you know, putting the, the, putting the day behind them and having a sit-down meal uh, with their partner or sort of, you know, just, just putting on a podcast while they cook their their meals that they've either have all the ingredients for or from a meal kit or something like that there's they're they're taking advantage of, of putting in having a good routine around what they're eating and that actually is a source of 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 stress release and 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 sort of a, a self check-in a self-regulating thing because it's part of their routine it's something that they can count on it's like oh you know no matter what i know i come home I have, you know, I have this 20 minute meal that I'm going to make. That's, that's time for me. That's time to get, get away from that and, and, you know, sh shift modes from work self to, to, to me time or something like that. So that's a very different way of thinking about food. It's not just nutrition. It's rather the, the very act itself is part of the self care space. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So when we look at these cultures within the self care space, we've talked about um, as Matt explained earlier, this sort of push for natural products and natural solutions like caffeine versus sugar versus reducing sugar versus going to natural sugar versus going to natural caffeine, as well as this concern and stress about proactive, uh, proactive health support uh, being torn between getting your the medical establishment to actually help you proactively take care of your health versus putting in the work and research and trial and error to take proactive concern of your own health is causing a lot of volatility in this space. Whereas we see right now, today, the biggest driver forward in the next while is this idea of approaching stress management holistically, working on your mind through your body, working on your body through your mind and building a routine that supports both, uh, as well as a big driver that is still early, but is growing really, really strong in this place is the idea of body neutrality and to support both meal planning. So really what we've seen between these three growing spaces is that seamless wellness is all about integrating health and well-being practices into your daily routine rather than tacking on new tasks. You already get ready for bed. You already make meals. Um, and it's about really seamlessly integrating ways to take care of yourself in the things that you do every day. Um, and this volatility in the wellness frenzy and in the wellness space we're seeing is, is going to be best served by speaking to these growing microcultures, these ideas and concerns around meal planning and body neutrality, um, as well as holistic stress management. And those old mainstays, that more natural solutions like reducing caffeine or reducing your sugar intake, as well as proactive health care and taking proactive steps, those spaces are uh, receding because they may add stress and make it more difficult to take care of your mind while you're trying to take care of your body. And I would like to pass it back over to Jason. Thanks, Derek and Matt. Uh, that was really, really great. Um, I do have a, a fair number of questions uh, here in the chat window, which I'm going to um, reprioritize a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry, we're not going to go first come first serve because I got one big question <laughs> that really jumped out as being pretty exciting. Um, okay. uh, so I'm going to try and kind of encapsulate it here. Um, at its core, is it fair to say that there is a broader movement where people are feeling they have to take more responsibility as in they're on their own like is wellness important because it's driving a link towards a control for survival um uh is, is basically kind of uh something that somebody picked up on as you were going through the process um i just wanted to get your comments see how you guys responded to that comment uh get an answer to that wonderful question yeah Matt, yeah I, I think they're yeah i think um it, yeah, that, 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 that's a strong way of putting it, but I think that is a, a real concern here, that, that wellness 
taking it's it's this desire to take charge of themselves and yeah. and feel what they the ways they could feel good about themselves and 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 that is empowering when you feel like you're taking full charge of yourself that really taking charge of your health that that feels empowering that feels like you're doing the right things and 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 it's you know there's sort of the idea of what you can control and what you can't control and there's all For these sure. external factors the economy their jobs you know all exactly. these things that are beyond their control yeah. and i think there's something really think... interesting too matt about the the kind of what you mm. pulled out in the advocacy uh of, of mm -hmm. the whole notion of being very proactive uh, and the frustration of going into mm. the kind of the medical system that is very reactionary and is like, oh, no, 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 don't come see me until I have until you have the problem, as opposed to working with you in order to prepare yourself for the future, which is like an interesting mm -hmm. tension, you know? So it's also, I'm curious if, if you guys think that this may have any linkages back to being almost kind of like in a post-COVID world, right? Where, you know, all of a sudden, you know, kind of the the illusion that, you know, there's going to be a hospital bed or the illusion that there's going to be these mm. things that are going to come in and solve a problem have kind of basically been erased. And now people are kind of recalibrating themselves to say, um, I need to take more responsibility for kind of what I'm choosing to do, because in a lot of ways, there is no safety net. So that's why I've got mm -hmm. to figure out ways to, 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 to fix my body, to fix my spirit, to fix my mind. Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. If you think of the last couple of years, uh, we, there was there was COVID as well as as Matt brought up uh, inflation and rising expenses and costs. Yeah. These external factors that they can't control, um, and of course, COVID put us all in a reactive position because it was unexpected and something we hadn't been really prepared for. I don't think people want to be caught in a reactive position again, and so they're taking care of their wellness and their health now by trying to find something that's easy that doesn't disrupt their routine too much like versus how covid disrupted their routine doesn't yeah. disrupt the yeah. routine too much <laughs> is easy to integrate into their lives as it, and keeps them prepared for whatever may come in the future uh with instead of having to rely on the medical system yep. or the economy to give them the solution that's great. Mm -hmm. That's really, really great. And it also actually kind of like is a great segue into another question that we had around the whole notion of, of pulling apart this idea of seamless, but in the context of kind of like some of the companies that are, you know, kind of here today, but also that we work with, right? Like if we think about food companies, if we think about personal care companies, if we think about, you know, companies that are creating solutions, um, it's so quick that we think about this idea of, uh, value and convenience, but this mm -hmm. added layer of seamlessness is really, really, really fascinating when we start to think about, yes, something needs to be easy, because the easier it is, mm -hmm. the more likely I am to fit it in. But the notion of seamless is, is that there's a right time and a right place for different solutions to fit with the consumer. Um, mm -hmm. Just curious about that responses to that comment that somebody made. Yeah, my, my first reaction to that is I think we see in the meal planning space slower growth because yeah. there are not great seamless solutions right now. Yeah. Uh, the growth was uh, was expected to only be about a, less than a percent, I think, in the short term. And I think it's because there isn't something consumers can latch on to. Of course, there's meal planners and meal trackers, but those are a lot of active work and they're, to be honest, not seamless. I'm sure we've all used a calorie counter or a meal planner or tracker before. Yeah. And <laughs> it's a lot of active work. It is not something you can seamlessly add into your life. So that it's growing slow because consumers are also really struggling to find a seamless way to integrate meal planning and healthy eating and permissible levels of indulgence and working with their body into their lives. Uh, where we saw a bit stronger growth when we talk about uh, uh, skincare solutions. And I think that's because consumers already know the right time and place to moisturize their face at their bedtime routine. Those, those routines are a little bit more solid and it's a little easier to integrate a solution. Uh, whereas consumers are really looking for a, a champion in that food planning space and someone to help them figure out how to actually get it done. Awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd say uh, piggybacking on that as well is is it's there's there's I I I see like opportunities for one's seamlessness as as opposed to just ease and convenience 
is really about something that could be integrated. And so sure, uh, 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 you know, something that's pre-cooked or, or sent to your house as, maybe as a meal kit, that's easy. But if that's not how you're already going about doing it, that, that it may in fact require a routine change, right? right. And so, so easy doesn't necessarily mean just slotting it in right away, right? So yeah, something like, uh, so so that that's a space where we could sort of tease out the differences there where you know what what fits in with their routine where could they add the where where could they you know small tweaks as opposed to a new addition uh, is really maybe uh, an, an operative way to think about seamlessness versus convenience very smart very smart yeah. um i i do have a couple of questions here that are a little bit more technical in nature so i'm just going okay. to uh, let um, everybody here know, um, we're gonna reach out separately about some of the methodology questions that kind of came up, uh, cause uh, we are running a little bit low on time and I do wanna give the opportunity to answer this last question. Um, okay. it's, it's, it's really kind of fun. Um, uh, I would love to just hear from both of you, was there something as you went through the process of doing this research and, and pulling this report together uh, that surprised you? Uh, like, was there something that kind of, you know, kind of challenged your preconceived notions uh, when we applied an anthropological lens to, to this particular topic? Yeah, I could start. Uh, for me, the, mm -hmm. the biggest surprise was the speed at which the body neutrality concept is growing. Um, not especially for how little we hear about it, I feel in our kind of mainstream cultural conversations, it's got real, real growth expected. It, it's it's still small, but it's expected to rapidly grow and possibly push the future of the self care space forward. Yeah. And when you tease it apart, it totally makes sense. It's it's totally obvious how body positivity could become a source of stress. I think even now the phrase uh, toxic body positivity is starting to come up sometimes a little bit more. But like it, when you reflect, it's it's very obvious how that could happen. But the, the push of this desire to not necessarily love your body or feel like you have to love your body, it's just like, look, this is my body. This is what I can do. This is what I would like it to do. This is how I get there. I'm working with it. Is It's a refreshing change to see, in my opinion, but it's also was, was very fascinating and unexpected for me. That's great. Yeah, I think that's a good one. For for me, it was sort of what's not growing or or what's showing volatility. The specifically the the nat the natural uh, microculture we looked at in caffeine. It's one of these things where a lot of times what I think anthropology does really well is uh, uh, give a, give an analysis or give a deeper understanding of of behaviors that we kind of see in ourselves or see in the world around us, but maybe less reflectively. And you know, to not to be autobiographical or something, but the the, the whole idea of, of changing one's caffeine intake is very much something that I've dealt with, and I've I've been thinking about and experimenting with in my my own personal life. But then, sort of looking into the data, and sure, you know, not only to, oh, other people are struggling with this too. It's, it's yeah. sure that's you know very validating, but more it's like, oh no, what's happening here? Why is it a struggle for me? And and. Yeah is is exactly you know sort of thinking about the 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 causes behind that what's at the what's at the you know what's the deeper issue here and sort of yeah. whether it's the seamless or se seamlessness or, or yeah. integration or sort of just this, this idea of, of singling out a cause or sort of a, this is going to give me the wellness i need the energy i need that really spoke to me and like oh this yeah. really fits with my life and my own struggles around this yeah. uh uh that's always neat when when doing a research project where it's like, oh yeah, this is something I've thought about, or or rather something I've felt, and now it's yes. the opportunity to think about it and and, mm. and put some numbers on it and put some yep. more meat on the bones is really uh, uh, always what's interesting to me about like what our anthropological insights in general and this project in particular. That's great. That's that's really really great. I mean, I also love the idea um, uh, that is really kind of tied to the tenets of structural anthropology where, you know, we are getting to kind of the relationship between a new and emerging idea and linking it to larger forces that are kind of starting to kind of push, you know, propel ideas forward in culture, which allows us to kind of predetermine to determine if, you know, something like 
uh, body neutrality, while may have less mentions, but the associations that people are linking to it are relevant to larger groups of people. This is how we can identify a trend in its early stages to really kind of predict and measure its potential. And you know, I, I think that that really came through uh, beautifully in the, in the work here. Um, so I will say thank you very very much to uh, both Derek and Matt. This is going to conclude the webinar for today. Uh, we're going to send this slide presentation and recording out um, to all of the attendees uh, via email, so you can look for that later on today. Um, and after leaving the webinar, uh, you were, will be prompted to complete a little survey uh, on the presentation. We always appreciate any feedback that you can provide because it helps us inform and improve kind of all of our future webinars. So please take a moment uh, and uh, take a look out for that. And be sure to also, you know, kind of take a look at the screen at some of the upcoming webinars that we will be presenting. Uh, but once again, I want to say thank you so much to Derek. Thank you so much to Matt. And thank you for everybody attending today. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks, Jason. Thank